The following audio is from Shiloh Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. For more information on Shiloh Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at shilohopc.org. Let us come to the reading of Scripture. From John chapter 19, verses 16 through 30, let us hear God's infallible word. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. They, so they took Jesus and went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews, re many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write, the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scriptures which say, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Thus far in the reading of God's holy and infallible word. Let us pray. O Lord, our God and Heavenly Father, as we come to meditate on this most poignant of moments, we pray that our hearts would be opened and that we would understand what it means, what Jesus said. Bless us now then, we pray, as we hear the word for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. When we look at um, the scriptures, uh, we are told, uh, quite rightly, uh, that there are seven last words uh, with regard to the cross, that Jesus said seven things. Well, they weren't single words, except the verses in our text, verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was f finished and s said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A single word in Greek. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put the sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. One word in the Greek. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What we see here in these words, some of the most important, essential truths for us to grasp 
from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had lived a, a godly life. It could be said of him, he truly was a godly man. He had died unjustly under false pretenses. And he suffered incredible agony, not only through the death of the cross, which in itself is terrible and painful, but also because he bore in himself the sins of the world. And in this word, teletestai, it is finished, he says to us more than simply that uh, he could bear no more. That's not what he's saying. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't act in that way. He's not saying, I've done enough. Let's get this over and done with. I'm done for. That's not what he's saying. He is making a very clear statement with regard to the needs of God's people. This word, teletestai, has, uh, uh, has as its root uh, words that are found in two other places in, in, in this latter part of John's Gospel. In chapter 13 and in verse 1, you find that the Lord Jesus Christ says, I do not know why the pages of my Bible stick together when I need them to be open most. But I'm quite sure that there is a reason for that. He talks here about loving his disciples. Now before the feast of the Passover, and when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And that word there has as its root the word that is in teleo, which means he's loved his disciples as completely as he can. And then we find the same word occurring or a similar word occurring in chapter 17 and in verse 4. And we read here, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Again, the same root word, for it is finished. I've done all I can with regard to my obedience to you. And now here he says, I have done what was needed to be done to reconcile sinners to an angry God. Because that's the meaning of it is finished here. I have done what needed to be done to reconcile sinners to an angry God. Well, how is this then finished? What does he mean? Well, he means, first of all, that the law has been fulfilled. We see that in, in the incidents at, uh, at the cross. For example, he prays for his enemies in Luke 23. We are told, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He prays for his enemies. He cares for his mother. We saw that here when he sees uh, um, his mother standing there and the disciple whom he loved, we're told. He said to his mother, woman, and he doesn't mean that in, a very, in, in, in any dis derogatory way. It's quite a common way of addressing in, in, in the East. Uh, he says to her, woman, behold your son. He is fulfilling the law. The law says that we are to honor our father and our mother. And he honors his father, his mother, particularly his father was not present and it's assumed probably quite rightly that he had died. But the care for his mother is manifest there. And then he, he makes peace with his enemies. There are two men on the cross along with him, either side. And one of those begins by railing against him. But then he comes to a realization that what he's doing is wrong and uh, he turns to the Lord Jesus and he says, I, I am sorry, I regret what I've said. And Jesus says to him, today you shall be with me in paradise. He's reconciled to his enemies. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfills the law even at this crucial point in his life. And so when he says it is finished, 
He has done what's required of him. He has fulfilled the law of God. Now you may say, well then, what's left for us to do? He's done it for us. It is a substitutionary atonement. He's dying instead of us. And in what he does in fulfilling the law, not only at this point, but throughout his life, he's done it for you and for me. We read the law faithfully Sunday by Sunday. Why do we do it? We do it to remind ourselves what is required of us as newborn people, as people who live in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't do it to be saved. That has been done. The Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law. It is finished. We have no need to try to, to kill animals and to uh, uh, pay fines and uh, do all the things that the book of Leviticus that we read through and the book of Numbers that we will read through that all require of us. It's finished. It's done. And he's done this in the face of an angry God. He's experienced the wrath of God. Father, forgive them is one thing. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani is another thing. He says on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is precisely facing an angry God. People don't like to talk about that these days. It's quite unfashionable. I'm quite sure that if any of you are here from other denominations where uh, such... Um, uh, words are not used, you, you'll think that I've become barbaric. I've not. Quite honestly, this is the truth. That God is angry with the wicked every day, says Psalm 7. There is no doubt that God is angry. We read that in the passage uh, from Leviticus this morning. That if his own people, he says, will not remember him, then he will be angry with them. Now, anger is not the same as bitter spite. Anger is what comes from righteous, uh, from disobedience to a righteous God. God's commands are right and good. And so the Lord Jesus Christ experiences the wrath of God. You have no idea. You cannot imagine what that is like. And I can assure you that you will not think for one moment that anybody here could experience the wrath of God. But the fact of the matter is that if you die without Christ, you will experience the wrath of God in all its just exercise, in all its just horror. You may, as you listen to... Uh, uh, news reports about um, ISIS think of how terrible it is the way in which they exercise authority, treat women, treat children, the way they treat those who disobey their commands. And you say, oh, these are horrific. It's nothing compared with the wrath of God upon sin. God is angry with the wicked every day. It's an anger that he stores up. And the Lord Jesus Christ bore that anger on the cross. And those who believe in him, for them it has no weight. It is finished. It is dealt with. It has been born. And this makes believing in the Lord Jesus Christ very urgent. And very modern and very useful. And, and very pertinent to our situation. God is angry with the wicked every day. And Christ experienced the wrath of God. This is why he felt that God had forsaken him. He knew this was coming. But I, 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 I suggest that he had no idea how brutal it was. He himself was angry with sin. And maybe he could experience that. But when he felt it, it was horrendous. And he felt it for you and for me. He didn't feel it for himself 
because he was perfect and had lived the perfect, blameless life, had obeyed the commands even in his death on the cross. And yet he endured the wrath of God. And he did it for you and for me. And the third thing that was true in this word is that he fulfilled the scriptures. Every word it hinted to us in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture. To fulfill the scripture in himself. We've said that before in verse, in verse 24. That was to fulfill the scripture, saying they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Both of these references are to, in fact, what the scripture says. And the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the scripture. When he says, I thirst, he's fulfilling the scripture. This is Psalm 69 and verse 15. They gave him sour wine to drink. Fulfills other scriptures too. But he fulfilled the scriptures right from the beginning. From the book of, uh, from uh, Genesis 3. When he came and uh, when we're told that uh, he would break the serpent's head and the serpent would bite his heel. And, and, and he fulfills that. He fulfills um, uh, Deuteronomy 18.18 18, where we're told about the prophet like unto you. The prophet has come, the teacher par excellence, the divine teacher. He fulfills the scriptures in his birth. We're going to be remembering these things in a few weeks. Remember, he's fulfilling the scriptures. He isn't being born simply because the Holy Spirit decided it would be a good thing to do. He is born according to the scriptures. Isaiah 7, 9, 11. All talk about the seed of David. About his coming and fulfilling those words. It was no great honor for him to become man. We tend to think that it's an honor to be like us. Really? So you'd want the almighty, eternal, and everlasting God to be like you? It was his humiliation. But he accepts that humiliation in order that we might be saved. And that humiliation is now ended. It is finished. Because now he will ascend into glory. And be there seated at the right hand of God, the Father, interceding ever for us. He fulfills the scripture in every part, from cradle to grave. And throughout it all, he shows a devotion to God, despite all his sufferings. After God deserting him, God deserted by God, he can say into Father, he says, Father, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. What amazing love, what amazing devotion. In the midst of all his sufferings, he can turn and he can commend the Father of heaven on his part. This then is what it means that it was finished. This is all over. His humiliation is over. His work of atonement is over. His devotion to the Father in earthly terms is over. He now will be in heaven itself. And he will take all those who believe in him to precisely that place. Let's say some things by word, way of application. The first is this. He died both as an atonement and an example. By bearing our sins and our sin, our essential sin, the very thing which makes us depraved human beings, the very heart of the being, he died for that. That belongs to us. It's from that springs all the behavior that is so appalling amongst us. All the, the, the sins of the mind. Um, we were listening to something last night uh, on television and uh, they were talking about this, um, this ISIS uh, group of people 
And the volunteers they have, they have sort of 50 a day. Well, why? They said, why? Well, because these people have had enough of playing games with brutality. And they now want to put it into practice. Isn't that terrible? You children, you sometimes play, I'm sure you, maybe your parents don't know it, but maybe you are playing games of, of incredible brutality, of killing, shooting people, cutting off people's heads. What's happened in, in this ISIS business? Well, precisely that. They brought into reality what you do on your computer games. And that's not the only thing. The same is true with pornography. That you see things happening and it titillates and excites you and then it leads to immorality and, and, and broken homes and marriages. This, my friend, tells us about our hearts. And the Lord Jesus Christ dies to atone for those sins. And those are not the only sins, of course. Sins of thought, word, and deed. How many of you have gone shopping and seen a beautiful diamond and you think, my wife would love that? And you thought, well, I wonder how I could get that out without anybody watching. Sin! <laughs> you know, we'd like to think that that was just amusing. It's not, it's sin. It's envying and desiring something that doesn't belong to you. You really have to guard and realize that it's for sin like that. That comes from your heart, from the very sore core of your being. And it gives um, evidence and it bears fruit in the sins we commit. My friends, it's essential that we understand that Christ died as an atonement. He paid for us. He put us at one with God. The word at atonement are those two words at one to atone to make us at one with God to bring us into fellowship with God he pays the penalty for the broken law he pays the penalty for our depravity he did this in order that we might be forgiven but not only that he died for our atonement and as an example an example of suffering for the sake of the truth. He was willing to endure thus so that the word of God might be elevated and believed. Do you believe the Bible? When you're holding the Bible in your hand, do you believe it? Do you believe it from cover to cover? Or as one man said, from lid to lid. From the beginning to the end. Because the Lord Jesus Christ believed the Bible. He lived the New Testament. Because all of the New Testament is concerned with his life. He lived the Old Testament fulfilling all the promises. And we should be glad that we have the word of God in our hands. The second thing is this. There was nothing held back in fulfilling all of God's word. He didn't hold anything back. He knew. He knew the scriptures. He knew the Psalms. As he hung on that cross, he must have meditated on, on Psalm 22, which begins, you remember, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then it goes on to speak of the brutal agony that he would bear. The Lord Jesus Christ lived the word. And you and I are given that example, to live the word. Of course, it's not popular, it's not fashionable, but it's true. We must live the word. We must value the word above all other things. Because this is heaven in our hands. The third thing is this. That this cry, it is finished, is a cry of ultimate victory. How can it be that? It's finished, yeah? The word of work of atonement is done. The work of exemplar is done. The word, word of, of living in this fallen world is done. And now glory opens before him. It's a cry of victory. He has defeated the enemy. 
He's taken the enemy captive and given good gifts to men, says Paul in Ephesians. This is God's gift to us. He has done wonders. He has declared himself a victor. And you and I need to realize how privileged we are that he has been victorious. The next step in his life, of course, as we well know, is Acts chapter 1, or it's, it's, it's in fact uh, uh, John chapter 1, uh, 21, and, 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 and the resurrection, and, uh, and then you have the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's victory. It's the cry of victory. I have overcome. I have paid the penalty. I have satisfied the law. I have quenched the wrath of God against sinners. The wrath of God has been quenched in my blood. And now people can come and have life eternal. And they can live to my glory. And they can come into my presence. It's a cry of victory. It isn't the end. It isn't the depressing cry. Quite to the contrary. He has been victorious. And the last thing for us is this, that we can face everything knowing that we see him and be with him and be like him. It's a victory for us. It's a victory for him, but it's a victory for us. We now will come into God's presence by believing and trusting in him. He's satisfied the wrath of God. He's paid the penalty on our behalf. And now we can look and say, my God is satisfied. My God is at peace with me if I trust and believe in his son. His son clothes us. When God looks at you, when you become a Christian, do you know what he sees? He sees Christ. Christ in you, but Christ clothing you, wearing his righteousness, shielded from all that God would, un, uh, uh, would uh, unveil against wickedness. You're shielded, you're covered, and you can venture anywhere and anything in order to serve him. Oh, my friends, so often we're afraid. We're afraid of what people will say. We're, we've no need to fear. Only one you need to fear, says the Lord Jesus. Not him who can kill the body, but he who can kill your soul as well. That's the one you need to fear. We don't need to fear anybody. Why? We're clothed with Christ. We see each other as we are. We think, wow, you don't look very tidy today. That's fine. Christ is in me, the hope of glory. Christ is in you. If you believe in the Lord Jesus, Christ is in you. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see you on one level. He sees Christ. Now it's true we have the duties and obligations of obedience to the law. But truth is that if we believe in the Lord Jesus, Christ in you, says the Apostle Paul, the hope of glory. Christ then cried this cry. It is finished. And he yielded up his spirit. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit, we're told. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't sort of die from exhaustion. He doesn't die as we die. He died giving up his spirit. He tells us in, in, in chapter 10 that he can take, take up his life. He can lay down his life. It's up to him when he will do it. This moment is his choice. This is the moment that he chose to give up his life. This is unbelievably wonderful. That Jesus was in control of the whole situation from beginning to end. It's not a cry of, 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 um, of despair. It's not a cry of frustration. Quite to the contrary. It's a cry which comes to us from one who is in control. And he's saying to you and to me this morning, let it be that I have paid the penalty for you and that you would live to my glory. Pray this in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, come near to us now. May we live comforted 
with the knowledge that you have paid the price for our sins and that we come clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We ask, O Lord, that your wrath, quenched by his blood, would now be vented only against injustice and wickedness and that we are concealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen.